as a cooperative, we're deeply steeped in our history and tradition. Back in the 1930s and 40s, we worked together and brought rural electrification to communities who didn't otherwise have it. We took that challenge square on. Carbon capture is yet another challenge and one that we need to tackle. We're willing to have some guts to try something new. If we could continue that spirit as well as allow for technology to get advanced and that benefit our region and our members, that's what we're supposed to do. The time is right now. We need to develop those technologies now for those existing plants and the plants of the future. We need to work as hard and as fast as we can on developing technologies to reduce the cost of carbon capture. Project Tundra is an effort on our part to try to figure out how to capture carbon dioxide off the back side of our largest coal plant. And we're doing that to try to figure out how to reduce the CO2 footprint of the generation that we provide. And it works basically by running the flue gas or the gas that comes out of the plant through a scrubber that will pull the CO2 out of it, remove it, concentrate, and allow us to store it permanently in a safe spot. The Project Tundra facility is being designed to capture CO2 from both generators at the Young Station, up to 4 million metric tons per year. And we have enough room for that. North Dakota alone has the geology to safely store 252 billion tons of CO2, which is the equivalent to all energy-related CO2 emissions in the U.S. for about 50 years. Yeah, so at the EERC, we've been working on carbon capture, utilization, and storage. Uh, since about uh, 2000. So we have a long history in our partners as well of understanding how you would inject carbon dioxide and how to do it safely and effectively. Uh, there are a couple other carbon capture, utilization and storage projects around the world, uh, but this will be the largest carbon capture project from a power plant. Uh, one of the great unique things about it, I think it's that perfect juxtaposition of geology, location, a region that understands how power is produced, all the jobs uh, and the people in the region that rely on that. And then on the top of that, to be able to have it with a very low environmental footprint, I think is a fantastic project. The, the real passion part for me is to fundamentally figure out, can we produce a better product um, that has better characteristics, that removes uh, things that, that we don't want to place into the atmosphere? Can we do that in a way that continues to provide cost-effective electricity that's reliable and dependable and allows for economic opportunity here in North Dakota. Once the uh, capture equipment's installed, uh, CO2 will be captured at a rate of roughly 4 million tons per year. That CO2 is compressed and then transported by a short pipeline to injection wells that will push the CO2 into formations, geologic formations, in the order of 5,000 feet down to as deep as 10,000 feet below the surface. At those depths, there are various geologic formations or horizons that are prime targets for taking the CO2 and storing it safely and permanently. Our best understanding about how injected CO2 might behave in the subsurface, we have to generate three-dimensional model of the geology deep below Milton R. Young. So we use wells that we drilled as part of the project, wells that were drilled in the past, geophysical data collected, like seismic surveys that look into the planet using sound waves, use all that information together to build our best representation of what the geology looks like in the deep subsurface. For ideal storage, you need porous sandstone that acts like a sponge and absorbs the CO2. You also need these non-porous or impermeable cap rocks above and below the porous rocks that will lock the CO2 in place. Milton R. Young sits right on top of a great interval of these types of rocks. Groundwater in and around center comes from less than a thousand feet down. Storage of CO2 in that area will take place at the depths around 5,000 feet up to 10,000 feet. Between that aquifer that people are using their water from and the shallowest target that we're going to put CO2 is thousands of feet of rock in there that's very good for keeping CO2 in place. So the risks are very negligible with respect to any impacts to the groundwater. 
but we're always going to double check. We're going to make sure that we sample that water. We put monitoring systems in place. There's a very rigorous regulatory process that we have to go through. It's a program that the EPA has oversight of. The program itself is called the Class 6 Underground Injection Control Program. It's based on the Clean Water Act, so its prime target is the protection of fresh water drinking sources. We are at a very exciting time. We're right at the cusp, right at the, the precipice of an explosion in the concept of carbon capture. There is no way for the world to meet the goals that the IPCC has set for CO2 concentrations without carbon capture. People that are skeptical or worried about the newness of carbon capture technology should just rewind the clock back to the 1990s and think about how new and skeptical everybody was for wind and solar. After 30 years of government support, those industries now claim that their technologies are on par with conventional power plants. You can add a substantial amount of renewables to the grid, and we are, and in the U.S. you'll see that number climbing, in our region you'll see it climbing. In Minn Kota's case, we have a substantial amount of renewables in our portfolio already, and until we have better storage opportunities, which are developing, and you'll see some battery-based storage, electricity is the only product in the world, frankly, that you can't store. We have to, as an industry, plan for those triple digit days where it's really hot. We also have to plan for those negative 30 degree days where climate can be very severe. As part of that, we need to have resources at our disposal to keep that grid reliable. Coal is a part of that strategy. We also have to have other energy resources at our disposal, and it all has to work together. And we've seen in places where there's been grid instability, it's because it lacks diversity and resiliency of resources. Globally, we're going to be using fossil fuels for a very long time. We in the, uh, in the United States have the benefit of, of adding a lot of renewables to our energy portfolio, which is outstanding. Uh, a lot of the rest of the world won't have that option, in the developing world in particular. Their energy resources are largely going to be fossil fuels. Uh, so we have this unique opportunity in the United States to be able to develop the technologies to utilize fossil fuels and not uh, emit carbon dioxide or be able to capture that and store it deep in the subsurface. The countries around the world that are just now industrializing, it's going to be important to raise them out of poverty to give them access to low-cost, reliable power. And fossil fuels are by far the best way to get that done. The problem that people find with fossil fuels is carbon emissions. And we have the technology with carbon capture. Let's use our, our brains, let's use our technology to solve the problem. When you look at the operating history of the Milton R. Young Station, it's an extremely high performing unit. And what's interesting about uh, that particular station is that even within the last three years, it's reached some of its best performing rates in its history. If you look at our units today, we've done a substantial amount of work on how do you remove what I'll call traditional emissions. So sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, things like mercury, we've done a, an outstanding job of inserting technology, which allows us to remove those uh, emissions from, and then CO2 being the last uh, most prominent. Congress said, we believe in this as well, and so they enhanced a tax credit. And now there are probably 20 different carbon capture projects under active development in the United States today. The driver of these projects is something called a 45Q tax credit. What it supplies is an opportunity so that every ton of CO2 produced and stored is reimbursed. The 45Q tax credit is going to pay $85 per ton of CO2 that we put in the ground and store. We're going to be storing around 4 million metric tons per year. And if you do the math on that, it's about $300 million per year in tax credits. Over 12 years, which is the life of this tax credit program, we're talking three to four billion dollars. You take the state we live in, North Dakota, which has been highly supportive. You take the benefits provided by the incentives of the uh, federal government. You take the cost effectiveness of our units. 
uh, and you put us in a position fundamentally that you think you're able to do that with little impact uh, to the end use consumers in this region, and yet the benefits to the people of Coral. To have the majority of these costs paid for by this tax credit presents a real opportunity for our membership. I was in the military for nine years as a combat engineer, and I actually served in Iraq. That was really eye-opening to see uh, conflict around the globe related to energy. And so what I wanted to do when I started working on this technology and others was really to develop the technologies uh, that could allow North Dakota, the United States, to be energy independent and to be able to develop the technologies here in the United States that we could rely on uh, so I wouldn't have to see my kids in the future uh, go halfway around the globe to fight for energy independence and, um, and that energy source. So that's what drives me. And everybody wants to leave the world in a better place than what we inherited. And these are the types of projects that enable us to do that. Because you know there's a real purpose for what you're doing and why you're doing it. And at the end, uh, to say to my kids, to my friends, to neighbors, I was part of that. It's a, it's a big thing. Certainly our history is from pioneering. I mean, without rural electric cooperatives, there would not be electricity in the rural areas, uh, particularly where we live. There's too many people who what electricity brings them around the world for you to see uh, fossil fuels go away. And so the, the pioneering part, I think, on our part is it's just a natural extension of who we are.